Hi, I'm Karen Mendez, and this is The Working World. Our guest today is Margot Anderson. She is the founder of Incent Network Group, a career advisory and professional network group for Australian repatriates. She's also the director of Talent Insight Australia, a career management and leadership consultancy. Margot and Insync in 2022 conducted a global survey of Australian expats to understand more about the role of work and the decision around returning home. The report was called, Do I Stay or Do I Go? In today's episode, we delve further into this report and pull out some really interesting findings around repatriates and retention for talent in that group. Um, one of the really interesting things that I found um, from Margot's um, analysis of the report was around some of the key findings of why expats uh, we're resigning after repatriation. Some of the gaps that we have in really understanding the data around that, specifically for diversity groups, and also some top tips for leaders around how to retain that talent as we continue to work through the war for talent that we currently are in. I hope you enjoy the episode um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time on The Working World. Hi Margot, welcome to The Working World. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Karen. It's great to be here. Great to see you again. I know. Long time. Lovely to see yes. you too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're very excited to have you on, um, obviously, because um, as you will know, this subject is particularly close to my heart in relation to, you know, focusing on that um, return talent, making sure that we integrate them back into the organisation and we, we work really hard to retain them and, and maximise and leverage that experience they've had while on assignment. Um, so for me, I'm really, really excited to kind of jump right into the conversation. Um, and I, I wanted to start by speaking to you a little bit about a report that you've recently done, which mm -hmm. has a really great title called Do I Stay or Do I Go? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to get an overview from you in relation to what the report's about um, and also, I guess, some of the recommendations you have for organisations on streamlining that transition from a repatriation point of view. Mm, yeah, great, thank you. Um, well, as we know, repatriation is often really considered that really hard problematic piece in an expat life cycle. Um, and I think one of the drivers for us running the uh, survey was to understand the role that career and work plays in an expat's decision to return. So we went out and interviewed um, or surveyed, there were 450 respondents. Um, 34% had come home in the last three years, 66% were still overseas, um, and 62% had spent five or more years overseas. So just to give you a little bit of context, context sorry, about the demographic. Um, yeah. And I think we had respondents from 51 countries, 28 plus industries, and some of those had gone of their own volition um, overseas. Some had relocated as part of an expat assignment. 31% actually had gone um, on an organisationally sponsored expat assignment. 24% had gone with an organisation but got themselves there, so without a package. Um, so 57% went um, for a work opportunity. So we know that work is a major instigator for a move overseas. What we have often seen in research that's been done to date is what is the motivator for people coming home? And mm -hmm. lifestyle is always number one. And we're like, well, we know career is really important whether you're with an organisation or not, but what does that actually look like? Um, so 70% said it's very important and it's particularly important around the timing of when we come home. So when we extrapolate down into what that looked like for organize, an organisational context, we looked at who had come home in the last three years. And 81% um, of those who did come home came are still with the organisation. Um, so that's a nice finding. Um, what we've got to overlay that to though is the last, what the last three years have looked like for us. So we will be really interested when we run this again, like is what was the COVID factor, so to speak. Now for those who did um, bound out of the organisation, what we know is that 25% um, left because the assignment came to a natural end. 25% left for a, what they called a better opportunity. 25% um, said that it was about career progression and pathway. 
Um, and then there was a component around cultural fit. And then there was the other kind of components. So it's really interesting when you start to break that down because you can then start to go, well, what, what does that look like? Or what could that look like inside our organisation? And what would that mean mm -hmm. for us? Um, yeah, sure. And as we know, like there's a myriad of different things there. Um, I think the biggest statistic that was really of interest there, though, was that 50% of those who had returned actively declared themselves on the market. So they were looking for opportunities outside the organisation that they returned with. So I think from a retention point of view, that is like, oh, are we aware of that? Are we actually aware firstly, of where our repatriates are in the organisation, how they're feeling about opportunities before them and what can we do to maybe unlock some of that awareness um, and how can we actually support that um, going forward. So I guess that's a bit of a snapshot of the report and some of the key findings that we found around that. Probably another one that's not necessarily specific to organisations, but in the expat um, world, is just how many people are spending one to two years planning their return from a career perspective home. So uh, more than 50% said one to two years, and then there were another further, I think it was 15% that said two or more years. So that's a lot of time like wow. looking at the organisation, endeavouring to find their right point of entry back into the organisation when they come home, thinking about what their strategy is. And so, again, I go, how aware, aware are we that that is what people's thinking is um, and that's what their activity is behind the scenes of their, of their role and their, their assignment? Um, because there's opportunities that lie in all of that. Um, so I think, um, you know, what does that sort of suggest for us? I think it's around, well, how are we uh, recognising or acknowledging where our current expats are offshore? What is their desire around return and the timing around return? But also, what is the realistically, what is the opportunity? When I, I work with both organisations and I work with individuals um, around that repat repatriation cycle, and I always like to say, remember, the organisation owns the role and you own your career. And so we need to make sure that that is a partnership that you start from and have some really constructive conversations. So as an, as an employee, you know, you've got to own some of those conversations and as an organisation, we've got to make it easy for those conversations to be had and to happen. And so I think my big driver or the big driver around the work that we do is really around how do we smooth those pathways back into organ back back in to organizations here. Um, and you know, conversations I have, you know, vary from, oh, look, we get them home, we get the boxes home, we get the, the family <laughs> home. And then we're like, off you go, um, mm -hmm. right through to others who have very structured programs. And so I think those that have structured programs, it doesn't mitigate any um, I guess, oh, sorry, it doesn't, it mitigates a lot of risk, but it doesn't guarantee, because as we know, we're all human and there's always going to be a percentage that opt out. But what we do know is that there is a lot clearer line of sight and there tends to be a lot more engagement around ownership from the individual if they can see how to own it. So um, I think that's probably what really inspired the report and some of the work that we do. Sure. I love that word engagement because I think that's actually probably the key to all this um, mm. from my experience too. I, I guess the, the repatriation process, you could look at it from a policy, well certainly from a policy perspective, it's a it's a it's a it's a certain point in time, it's a part of the policy, it happens right at the end, right? Mm -hmm. But in actual fact, from a successful model perspective, repatriation starts from the day they leave, right? So yeah. that engagement piece is so key to yeah. the success of the repatriation and the retention of that individual um, that, you know, if you, depending on how you structure your program, if you have that engagement with that individual all the way through, then Absolutely. that leads to greater success, which I'm sure your report um, mm. highlighted. Yeah. Did, it, did the report go into, um, I guess, those examples of successful programs where you did see some, some um, good rates around retention of repatriation? Were there key takeaways from those 
organisations about what they were doing well in relation to retaining that talent? No, it's an excellent question. And what I think what this was the first time we'd run the report. And so what we have learned is that our second report has a whole lot of areas that we want to delve a little bit further into. And one of them is exactly that. Like, what is the practice for the, um, the individual? What's the experience from a, um, the individual's perspective? And what is the practice from the organisation's perspective? So, you know, even in conversations that I've been having with people like Deb at um, the Employee Mobility Institute, you know, like, what are some of the things that she's seen? So we're talking about how can we leverage some of the insights together to really raise the, I guess, importance and awareness around what, what is great practice and what can we be doing to, to heighten that? Um, I always often say to both organisations and individuals, like repatriation is like a prenup. <laughs> you know, you kind of got to get it on the table before you leave. And I, think, I love that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I think putting it on the table just it can take away that that um, fear. I mean, a lot of expats individually will say to me, "Oh, it's very out of sight. I mean, out of mind, out of sight, out of sight, out of mind." Um, so, you know, I think, though, that when you set up what that looks like before you leave, as you say, what are those points of conversation and check in? And we all know that landscapes change. You know, if you go offshore for three years or five years, you know, the, the base that you're leaving from doesn't stay static. It's got a life. It changes. It evolves. So how do we keep people engaged with what's happening back here? So there are a couple of practices that I see that are really strong um, and good. And I think that those conversations that are head, held right at the beginning, I think that commitment to engage in meaningful dialogue and conversations around what is going on with the organisations that the organisation they're a part of, you know, it's fundamental changes. Naturally, there's going to be fill and spills and changes in leadership and changes and things. But, you know, are there key things that are happening in the industry that are changing the problem set that the organisation is needing to solve? Or are there new emerging pressures and competitors in the marketplace here that, you know, when you're away, you don't always have line of sight on? So how do we keep people informed of what that looks like? I often think I say to people, set up a sponsor and a mentor before you go so that you've got a, a voice and a point back in and find somebody who is, yes, at your level, but also find somebody who is one to two steps, you know, higher in the organisational structure as well, because we all move and change during that time. And we want to know that we've got line of sight with various levels within the organisation. So I think setting those structures and pathways up is really important um, and then just as we invest so much time and effort in uh, making sure that people land well when they arrive um, in their new country, we need to remember that when people are returning, it's not just a career transition or a job transition, it's also a life transition. And I think it's really underestimated by both the individual and the organisation just how big that can be for individuals. So it changes the way we look at the world. Um, and the way we solve problems and the way we approach things. So how do we make sure that each party is up to date with um, or, you know, current with that thinking, those motivations, motivations being a really big one, um, and what are the concerns when you come back? So, you know, again, if I go back to a practice point of view, I think about, well, what are the points of engagement and how do you, um, I guess, ramp those up, you know, sort of, six months, four months, two months, one month, you know, and not just think just logistics, but thinking about what are the career opportunities and pathways for these awkward people. And look, there's a lot of times, you know, we can't create things out of thin air, but we need to be honest and transparent about what the opportunities look like um, within the organisation, you know, from an Australian base. Um, I think that's just the nature of um of great leadership and and having those conversations so mm. sure yeah i mean it, it it's it, it's funny you use the analogy around prenups because i guess I, you know, international travel or assignments, you know, does have a, a romance around it, right? Oh. And so, but they're very much when reality does set in, um, I, I think that, yeah, it's good to kind of have those pragmatic conversations up front. Mm. So that, that's really interesting. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Um, 
On the flip side of that, though, I guess, are you did your research highlight some reasons, key reasons why talent did look to resign post repatriation? I mean, you touched on it a little bit in relation to, um, you know, they certainly were making themselves available for other opportunities. There was a large proportion you spoke about there, but it did it dive into the details of what that trigger was for them specifically? Well, I think that I've probably got some observations anecdotally in combination also with the report. So what I often hear from people is, is like, I just am so disconnected from the organisation and I'm disconnected from people. And so it's about how do I navigate this local context? Um, I'm bringing back, you know, knowledge of international markets, which are often bigger markets, um, so where is the readiness um, and appetite for that knowledge to be engaged with or contributed to or listened to inside the organisation? Where is it relevant, basically? Um, and so how do we help individuals both here locally on the ground and those who are returning find those mutual points of relevance? And also to say, sometimes it is about saying, that's great but we're not quite there yet, but I'm glad you've got that because we're going to, in six months' time, leverage X, Y, and Z. So having those really open sharing kind of conversations um, I think is really important. Um, I think one of the really sad things I hear anecdotally is people say to me, Marco, it's just easier if I look elsewhere and start afresh somewhere. It's If I'm going to go to all this, like, it's too hard. You know, I feel... I feel too, um, I feel like it's been too disregarded, you know. So I was really of interest when I was going out. I'm actually not of interest anymore when I come back. And so that's a feeling. So, I mean, like we can work with that, but it's got to take some structured activity around that. So the, often the coaching programs that we get involved with are around, okay, how do we help identify and build those connection points inside an organisation? Because I think that's really important. Because if you're the individual coming back and you're going, your engagement's going down <laughs> or your sense of self-confidence is going down, you tend to retreat you don't tend to lean in. So how do we find those ways to help people lean in a little bit more? Um, and conversely, from an organisational perspective and a leadership perspective, I think, you know, there has always been a great chasm in the past between global mobility and talent mobility. So how do we bring those worlds together with real meaning and pragmatism um, and honesty and transparency so that people can see what is possible? Um, because I think that's really important. People want, like, I really genuinely believe that people will own their path if they can see it. Often the problem is, is that they can't see it. So when we see statistics from the report that say things like, you know, lack of professional challenge, better opportunity somewhere else, um, you know, I think that that, or no career progression, that were the three pieces. It's like, was that actually, have you validated that or is that your sense of what you're, you're seeing, you're, you're feeling? Um, so I think there's a lot that needs to happen in that really um, sort of three months before you get, get home and the three to six months once you land back here. And so I often talk to organisations and say, what is your re-onboarding policy? Because it is a re-onboarding. You know, how do we make sure we understand the depth of, knowledge networks. Networks are a really big one that these people hold um, because often you sometimes think, oh, yeah, I forgot, I know that too. Or forgot, yeah, actually, I know those people. I could open that door for you. So how do they, how do we capture that and leverage that inside an organisation? Because it actually expedites or makes things faster, you know, rather than slowing things down in terms of execution. Um, but again, you know, again, checking in at that one month, three month, six month mark. One of the big statistics that came out about people's reservations of coming home was what are the opportunities for their partners and how will they go when they land? So that's also a big consideration, not so much for the organisation to own, but to be curious about, because if this person has landed back and their partner or spouse is not landing a job, like I have a lot of people in our community who've come home with international partners who just cannot find traction here and they end up rebounding. They go back to where they were 
that the individual who's employed by that organisation resigns and thinks it's just easier to go back to the States or to the UK or wherever it is because I've got a professional network there. So I will find something more easily. So how do we stay abreast of where people are at and what are their challenges? Because, you know, we can hopefully point people to other avenues of support outside of the organisation as well. Hmm. Fascinating. It's, um, yeah, it's a real... Um, it's a real challenge around mind shifts around how do you make the old become the new for them, yeah. I guess, potentially. Yeah, yeah, it is very much. Mm. Yeah, and you, you spoke around kind of support networks. And so um, I wondered whether you um, in your profession have visibility, you know, for those who are repatriating about what's on offer from outside organisations. So community groups um, yeah. could be alumni of a repatriated um, individuals in certain organisations or even externally, what are you seeing in that space that provides that greater scaffolding yeah. for them when they return? Well, that's interesting because that's actually why InSync started, the InSync Network Group, because it started as a network. Because my, my background is really in workforce planning and all of that change and leadership piece. So I would go into organisations in my, you know, day job through my other business and I would talk about, you know, what my career journey might have been. And invariably, if there was an expat in the room, they'd be like, oh, my gosh, Marco, how did earth did you navigate that when you got back after that period of time away? And I said it was tricky. And the thing that really helped me was knowing that I wasn't alone in how I felt that way. So InSync really formed initially as a professional network for those people who were returning. Because even if you return with a role, you still need a network to do the job as opposed to find the job. You need to know, well, what's going on in the industry. You need to connect with other like-minded, you know, people who are facing similar challenges. And so that's how that, that the network formed and it's evolved since then into the workplace practice and also into coaching for expats. But, you know, from another point of view, there are, you know, organisations such as Australian, um, sorry, Aussie Expats Coming Home, which was a Facebook group that started, um, you know, just pre-COVID. But they are amazing with the support they give around some of the logistical challenges. Um, and so they've got local community coffee groups, et cetera, that can also be just a social gathering that we all like, right? We all need to know that we've got our our people somewhere. Um, it what's it's what drives connection to our communities as well as our organisations. Um, I think advance.org also for those people who are still abroad, they are good at you know really trying to promote what's what is actually happening in Australia. So they can be another information source. Um, if you jump onto Facebook, there's invariably a repat group somewhere that will provide something. Um, so I think between understanding what the issues are that people might be navigating or finding just a little bit more challenging then means that as an organisation we can say, look, why don't you go and have a chat to these people or how can we introduce you to these people? Um, so I, I think we've, we're easy to find if, you, if we're on your radar, you know. So, yeah. And what yeah, I would right. say and, it, yeah, oh, is expats right. are unbelievably generous with sharing mm -hmm. knowledge and networks. So I can't tell you the amount of times that I've sat down at the table and people have said, right, what do you need? Where are you at? Um, who do you need to know? Um, you should come along to this <laughs> breakfast. It's an industry group. You know, they scoop people up. So, yeah. Mm. And that's probably because they've been on the receiving end of, of yeah. that support from someone else. So you're right. It, it does spark a, a sense of community, I think, once mm. you, you enter into an assignment or a relocation. You mm. really can understand what's involved and the nuances mm. that you couldn't unless you, you'd done it yourself. Mm. Um, but I think you, you highlight a good point around there are lots of different, um, there's diversity around the needs um, because, it, you know, we, we, Globe Mobility essentially cap captures an individual at a very sensitive time in their life. Right. So it's it's almost where their career and their personal lives are intersecting and then you take both of those and put them into a completely um, different location, obviously, um, but, you know, can be stretching them right outside their comfort zones in multiple ways. And so I wondered whether, you know, your data had, had spoken to um, or highlighted, you know, 
um, potentially drilling down into different diversity groups. So whether that be female or um, Indigenous or um, in, a, in a community sense, does your data tell you anything about, you know, what the success of repatriation looks like around some of those diversity groups? No, it doesn't in a word, um, but that oh. is, a, you know, again, a great question because it's something that we've put on our radar for our next, um, our next survey. Um, and I think particularly in probably partnering with some organisations to help capture what's important to them and how they're going to use that data in terms of services, because I mean, what we do know is that there is very little research in general at all around those groups in an on an expat cycle, let alone at that tail end of the repatriation cycle. I know um, Mercer runs some um, some good surveys and produces some good data around this. And even if we look at you know, women, for example, you know, there's only twenty percent of the expat workforce is made up by females on expat assignments. So if we don't know the data, we can't actually you know, break it down into meaningful chunks for our organisations and put some policies and frameworks and strategies around that. And I think, yes, we need some groups that can do that, but we also as an organisation need to capture that for ourselves. So I, you know, I'm a really great believer around assignment debriefs. I think every single organisation should be doing that thoroughly when somebody comes back, because you know, it's like anything when you first come back, you, you, do, you, you share with fresh eyes. So cap, trying to capture why someone left two years later, if you think it's about repatriation and linked to repatriation is a bit tenuous in terms, terms of drawing those connections. But if we can capture that sense at the beginning of how people are feeling when they're back and then follow that through good sort of re-onboarding programs, we can then link it potentially to times that people, you know, resign or leave or move on. But at the moment, it's just not talked about or it's not captured. So we're kind of a bit finger in the wind with how we actually respond, I think, to some of these things. So... I mean, from a practice point of view, I think assignment debriefs would be really helpful in capturing that and around some of these, you know, minority groups or some of these different groups that we need to look at. So hmm. it, it's um, I think, you know, the work that you're doing is really important. And I think that the full extent of it is probably going to to expand even further. So if I think about some of the things that I see you know, th these conversations are going to take on a new life when we particularly start to focus on this remote work more and more yeah. that has come about during COVID, right? Because I know traditionally you and I have been talking about today traditional assignments that last yeah. you know, three, four years and, you know, that's a long time away. But now we're seeing that same behaviour happen in a lot more of a condensed space. So it could be two, three months, for example. Um, mm -hmm. But even those things you were talking around about line of sight of career. Um, so it, it, it made me think around, you know, the questions are being raised from a remote working perspective around if I'm not physically in the office, if I'm out of sight, out of mind, how do I make those connections around career development? So mm -hmm. there's a lot of similar th themes that I can see in the work that you're doing that mm -hmm. will stretch across the, the I guess, the the chasm of remote working that we're all yet still to bridge. And yeah, so I think absolutely. it'll be some of your learnings that you've already done, that data that you're already pulling, I think will be really useful mm. in relation to remote working. And one of the other things that made me think that as well is right at the start, you were talking about work being a major motivator from a percentage point of view around going on assignment. Whereas I'm seeing from um, the in-house perspective that a lot of the motivation is actually coming from a, a, an employee's self-motivated perspective, not necessarily roles, mm. but the individual circumstances. And so it would be interesting in 12 months, you know, we'd love to have you back to see yeah. around whether that, you know, you've expanded that data, whether that data starts to tell a very different story now that we're kind of moving to a, a new way of working within global mobility, I think, um, more broadly speaking, and whether you'll be able to, to capture some of that data and whether it looks differently. I, I couldn't agree more. I think the world of global mobility and talent mobility is a really exciting place. Um, mm. I'm, I mean, co the COVID factor or the COVID impact is really interesting because the people who were coming back were either coming back 
you know, just before COVID, because we had a three-year marker on when you could have returned to do the survey. Um, and sure. the survey closed out in October last year. So it was largely COVID returnees that we were capturing. And that was a real washing machine of why people were coming home um, and just how we as a country responded, you know, yes. to getting people <laughs> home. So that all of those, those insights came out in the survey as well. Um, and so we were we we just couldn't find any data around the role of career. So we know we started broad, but we feel like we've you know taken the lid off now, and we've got all these lovely areas that we can go in and have a bit of a deeper look at. Um, so I think this piece around um, organisational practice and policy, not just for those who've been away for a long time, but a short time, you know, is really sure. important and. You know, are people wanting to go because they've been locked up for three years or two years too? You know, is it just like, yeah, <laughs> we can go, yeah. And actually yeah. now there's more choices about how we can go. It's not just mm -hmm. I can go to the UK on a two-year working holiday visa or, you know, to the US on, um, on their E3 visa or whatever that might be. There are other ways that we can go and live abroad and work mm -hmm. remotely. So That's it's... Right. A little bit uncharted territory but I think we've also then got to think about well how do our other systems of practice make yes. that enticing and you know what impact does that have on superannuation you know I'm, I had a mm. text from somebody um, in our community actually who's a lawyer in our community he said I don't know if you've seen anything about the changing New South Wales laws that are coming around superannuation not counting when you're offshore with an assignment now I only, I only got that I only got that text oh. yesterday so I don't know oh dear the answer is. don't tell me that <laughs> but, but you know these are new things that will actually right. impact the world of mobility mm. and yeah. people's appetite for assignments or why they will or won't come home you know yeah, so exactly mm, so it's very so, yeah. So when when when's your next uh, your goal for the next report to be I guess captured and then released? What's what's your cadence around reporting and capturing this data? We would like to do a survey every two years. Um, sure. I think one of the things we learnt doing it is it's actually a big it's a big um, piece of work. An it's an amazing piece mm. of work, but it's um, it it is an undertaking. Um, and we also think too, in two years' time, there will be enough distance between potentially the COVID impact, and we might have a little bit more data you know, around our working world today, um, which will sure. position us forward. So it's all about positioning forward. You know, how do we use yeah. that to right better practice and, you know, join those dots, I think. So beautiful. Mm. I guess my my final question for you today is, um, and certainly from the audience, is what would be your top tips, I guess, as a summary for leaders who are looking to retain repatriated talent? What do you want to leave them with about the must-dos? Okay, so when we say leaders, I think this, to me, that really encompasses a couple of groups within our organisation, and I think it's about sure. bringing them together. So global mobility, talent mobility, and line managers. So making sure that there is great communication and clarity of process and support um, that's in, I guess, in sync between each other for those three areas, because otherwise we've kind of got disjointed practice inside our organisations. So with that in mind, um, I think, you know, communicate, communicate, communicate. You can't over communicate <laughs> if it's consistent um, in those touch points when people are back. Um, I think assignment debriefs, I can't tell you how much they're worth their weight in gold because it really can identify potential retention risks, potential concerns, career concerns. If 50% of our people are actively looking upon their return or within the first year, we need to get under the bonnet of why um, mm. because I also think that will help us drive better practice. I think also remember that you are not alone as leaders who are managing this problem or as an individual who is returning and that there are groups that can support and add value um, to both individuals and organisations around that. And I mean, even just from a community perspective, tipping people into a community, um, it sounds like an easy thing to do, but if all of a sudden I'm a returning expat who actually doesn't have anyone to go and have a beer with at the end of the day, um, and all of a sudden I can go and do that with three other people who get it, 
that's amazing, mm. you know. Mm. Um, and to do it in a professional context, I think, is really important because we need to really, I think, find ways to fast track that reconnection. Um, so I, I think that's that's really important. Um, I think to remember as line managers, you play a really, really important role in your daily, weekly, monthly, whatever your check-in cycles are around just making sure how people are feeling about these things. Well-being is a really big thing that comes up, um, you know, both for organisations but also for individuals around this time. Even when we, we've partnered a couple of times with expat psychs, um, and they talk about the repatriation cycle as being the most fraught um, in its complexity around that. So just as leaders being mindful um, around that piece is really important. And I think being able to actively demonstrate and show what the pathway or potential is. And if the individual takes it up, great. If they don't, they don't. But they know that there is a pathway um, yeah. here. Mm. And support the there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Mm. Fantastic. Thank you, Margot. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. It's such a refreshing topic to have that focus shift back mm. to to the employee support. Um, and I completely agree. I think, you know, whether it's outbound briefings or inbound briefings, I think they're one of the most underrated valued mm. services out there. So, um, mm. yes, I would call to all leaders to, to heed yeah. Margot's advice. <laughs> 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 oh, it's, um, it's yeah it's such an interesting time and and yeah. we're in a war for talent you know in this global war for exactly talent, yeah you know, we need to know we need to know and understand yeah 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 absolutely well thank you so much for joining us today on the working world it's been lovely to see you and have our conversation and um yeah we look forward to the next set of data coming out and in whether it's in a year or two we look forward to having you back on to discuss that so thank yeah, you wonderful. for your time thanks so much it's been a pleasure Take care.